I'm Ken Rockwell with KenRockwell.com and KenRockwell.tv. Let's take a quick look at the new Nikon 120 to 300 millimeter f2.8 lens. And I'm even going to cover a user's guide for it. It's got a lot of switches, a lot of features. First and foremost, the 120 to 300 millimeter is exactly 50% longer than an 80 to 200 millimeter lens on each end. It's the same f2.8. You pay an extreme premium for the simple advantage of having an extra 50% more focal length. That's just the nature of optics and reality and marketing and business. To get this extra 50% in focal length, you have a lens that now weighs more than twice as much, over 7 pounds, as a 70 to 200 2.8. You have a lens that costs over three times as much, and this beast is over a foot long and over 5 inches in diameter. The beauty of that is any place you go, people know you're the boss. They know you're the pro. That means the little people will just get the heck out of your way. And the VIPs that can help you and help you get to the talent you need to and get to the locations you need to immediately know you're the guy that's there to get the business done. So even if it wasn't a great lens optically, that's also a very useful thing to have. The close focus distance is six and a half feet or two meters. That's twice as far away as a 70 to 200 lens typically shoots. That is a major disadvantage because it reduces the amount of things you can photograph. Your operational envelope shrinks with this lens because nothing can be closer than about six and a half feet. For me, that's a major disadvantage. It's got a regular mechanical zoom ring and it has a full-time manual focus ring. Just grab that ring at any time, boom. You're manually overridden, which means if you need to catch focus or do anything, it just works the way it should, which is much better than some of the other brands, especially the mirrorless brands today. What's new about it is that it uses a new SR optical compound. And Nikon never says if it's glass, so I don't think it is. Canon has used this for a couple of years. They call it BR Blue Refractive Compound, which I think is a jelly they squirt in between some of the glass elements. Nikon's SR, which is Short Wavelength Refractive Compound, essentially is there to reduce the spherochromatism or occasional colored fringes on out-of-focus, high-contrast things. What's good about this lens is it has extraordinary optical quality. As those of you who haven't been shooting for 50 years as I have, may or may not realize is every Nikon and Canon Ultratel in the f2.8 range, ever since they started making them back in the 1970s, has had extraordinary optical performance. Nikon's first 300 millimeter f2.8 of 1977 still to this day has incredible optical performance. People don't pay $10,000 for this lens because it's super sharp. All of these lenses have been super sharp. They pay $10,000 for this because of what it lets them do. To go places and get into optical ranges that you haven't been able to get with any other professional lens before. Something else nice about this lens is it has programmable front control buttons. And I'm going to cover what they do when I get to the user's guide towards the end of this video. Of course, it's got ultra-fast autofocus. What's interesting is, is Nikon's marketing is always trying to tell us that even their crappy lenses have super-fast autofocus. So they don't really know how to tell us that the pro lenses like this have super-duper-fast autofocus. But for instance, as I showed with my video on the 200mm f2, it's just in an eye blink. It'll focus from near to far. It's ultra-fast. And considering a major use of this is for force in action, then by all means, that's another advantage of this lens, which you might not get compared to other consumer lenses. Of course, it's got image stabilization. That's a, that's a given today. Only bad things about it is that it's big, heavy, and expensive, and it doesn't focus as close as I would like it to focus. What's missing from this lens? Well, it only stops down to f22. If you're doing nature and landscape, sometimes you want f32 or f45 with lenses this long. This doesn't do that, but if that's what you're doing, you're not paying extra for this f2.8 Ultratel. It doesn't have a 52 or 40.5 millimeter rear filter drawer. Most of Nikon's more recent lenses, in fact, I think all of their 300mm f2.8s have always had a rear filter drawer that lets us use small, inexpensive filters instead of the big one on the front. And ever since about 1983, all the Nikon Ultratels have included an optical flat plate on the front. So if the front of your lens is damaged, instead of replacing a very difficult to replace element or one that maybe in 20 or 30 years can't even be bought, by simply having the front of the lens been an optical flat filter free at no extra charge in all of Nikon's other Ultratels that saves you some money. This lens has no protective front glass plate, which means you've got to buy, or at least I would think, and I will buy, a 112 millimeter ultraviolet filter to keep on the front just to protect the lens. We didn't used to have to do that with most of Nikon's recent Ultratels. With what cameras does this lens work? It's optimized for Nikon's digital single lens reflex cameras. It won't work on any of the 35 millimeter cameras because none of their 35 millimeter cameras, although it'll mount and shoot and autofocus just great, the diaphragm, it's got a new electronic diaphragm, so this diaphragm won't work on the older cameras, which to be honest, isn't that much of a difficulty because we're probably gonna shoot this lens at f2.8 all the time anyway. And for that, it'll always shoot at f2.8, no problem. It works on all of their FX DSLRs. It works on most of their DX DSLRs. And by works, I mean that diaphragm will also work. It'll certainly shoot on all of the earlier DX DSLRs. 
those made before about 2007, but you'll always have to shoot at f2.8. And you know, if you don't mind shooting at f2.8, even on a 1959 Nikon F, presuming this will mount, which it should, but it should shoot just fine. You can focus manually, you can zoom manually. It'll just always shoot at f2.8, which is probably where you want to shoot this lens. And certainly you can look at my Nikon lens compatibility chart to see all the explicit details with your particular camera. What does Nikon call this? They call it the Nikon AFS Nikkor F2.8E FLEDSRVR. What does that all mean? AFS and SWM stands for the silent wave motor. That's how it focuses. E stands for electronic diaphragm, which is the new electronic diaphragm, which copies Canon's innovation of 1987 in their EF mount. FL stands for fluorite elements, which again, Canon has been using since the 1970s and uses in many of their ultra tells today. Uh, it's a new thing for Nikon, but that's the FL designation. ED stands for extra low dispersion glass, which Nikon has been using since at least the 1970s to make these ultra tells. SR, as I covered earlier, is the short wavelength refractive compound that they use to help reduce spherochromatism. And VR, as we all know, stands for vibration reduction, which is Nikon's brand of image stabilization. So we can handheld this beast at slow speeds. It also has internal focusing. It's gelded. It's a G lens. It does not have an aperture ring. It has nano crystal coat and Arneo coat, which is another magic coating from Nikon. Optically, it has 25 elements in 19 groups. Here in this diagram, the deep magenta is the fluorite element. There's a big one in the front and a little one in the middle. The yellow is the single ED element. And you'll notice the pink element is the SR, short wavelength refractive optical compound element. Its maximum reproduction ratio is 1 to 6 and a quarter, or 0.16 to 1, which is fairly typical for most lenses. The stabilizer is rated for four stops of improvement, which is fairly typical for these ultra tells. The front lens cap isn't a cap. It's a big neoprene sock that covers the lens and the hood. So it just covers over the whole front of the lens. The rear cap is the standard Nikon LF4 rear cap. It comes with an HK41 front hood, just a tubular hood. It comes with a CLL2 padded case. It's 5.1 inches in diameter by 12 inch extension from the flange. That's 128 millimeters around by 303 and a half millimeters extension from flange. Of course, the back of the mount pokes out a few millimeters beyond that. And the hood makes it even longer as well. It weighs 114.6 ounces or 3.25 kilograms or 7.2 pounds. Let's compare this to other similar lenses. Now, there's no 120 to 300 millimeter of 2.8 professional lens made. I think some of the junk brands make one, but they're not professional. The other brands may have decent optical quality when you first buy it, but the internal mechanics aren't up to pro level. And the worst part is about seven years from now when their warranty is expired and you go to have yours fixed, you may discover your exotic junk brand lens can't be fixed, making it a very expensive proposition to buy a cheap lens. You buy the Nikon lens or the Canon lens for $10,000, it's going to last you for quite a long time and still have a lot of value when or if you try to go to sell it, and the camera makers will still stand by it and repair it for many years in the future. Here's our comparison chart. The pictures aren't to scale on this chart. Of course, this is the most recently introduced lens. What's curious is Nikon's 300mm 2.8 was introduced just over 10 years ago, so I wouldn't be surprised if they have a new one of that out, but guess what? It's not going to be any different than what they've been selling. The close focus is the biggest difference. You just can't get that close with any of these ultra tells that you can with the 70 to 200. The maximum reproduction ratio is fairly similar across the breed. You notice they have different filters. The first two lenses, which is the 70 to 200 and the 120 to 300, have front filters and no rear filter slot. The lenses on the right have no front filter slot. They include an optical flat, but they have drop in filters in the rear. The outside diameters, you'll notice the three lenses that go to 300 millimeters are all about five inches around, while the 70 to 200 is certainly much smaller. The overall length, again, the 70 to 200 is short, only about eight inches long. The others are 10, 12, 13, 14 inches long. We have a price per pound just because I could. If we compare this lens at $10,000 to some lenses that really don't compare because they're only about $2,000, but they do cover the same focal lengths, the difference is if you don't need f2.8, which honestly I don't because f2.8 I need it for film. I don't need f2.8 for shooting digital. You have the choice of the 80 to 400 or the 200 to 500, which are marvelous lenses. Neither of those focuses that close, but they are significantly less expensive and also smaller. How do we use this great lens? Well, you notice there's a lot of switches here, so let's cover those. The AMMA M switch. Well, AM 
is where you usually want to leave that. That's autofocus, and if you grab the manual focus ring, it'll manually focus. But it'll ignore it if you knock the ring just a little bit. If you go to MA, now anytime you so much as even look at that ring, the slightest amount, it's going to take over into manual focus. And that's a little bit different to use. And M simply locks out autofocus, so it's always in manual focus. The full slash infinity dash 6M switch, that's a focus limiter. I leave it in full. If you have a problem with the lens hunting back and forth and back and forth, you can put it in the 6 meters to infinity, which means it won't focus on anything closer than 6 meters or 20 feet. So if it does have to hunt, it's not going to hunt as far. But I've never had a problem with that with this lens. But it's not a bad thing to do. If you're shooting sports and the only thing that might come closer than 6 meters or 20 feet to you is something on which you don't want to focus, selecting that position will prevent the lens from even looking there. The VR, off, normal, and sport, I think we know what these are today. Leave it at normal all the time. Even if you're shooting on a tripod or shooting on a monopod, if you're shooting any kind of action, because just knocking the lens, it'll actually control that, which is a very good thing. I only turn it off if I'm going to make a long time exposure. By long, I mean a second or more, because then the VR can't help you that much over that long a period of time, and your tripod should stabilize by then. But if you're shooting on a monopod, especially shooting sports, leave it on. And of course, if you're shooting sports, that's why we have a sports position. Here's the fun thing. The AFL Memory Call AF On Switch. This controls, and it's beautiful. You don't need to putz around in a menu. You just move this switch, boom, that's what those buttons do in the front of your lens. The three positions are AFL. That's what I use. That means anytime you hold one of those buttons on the front, the, the focus will lock. The reason you use that is if you want to focus and recompose. It also is if you're shooting around, you're panning around, and there are things that block your subject as they're maybe running from point to point. If you hold that button, it'll prevent the lens from trying to focus on something else. So when you release that, it'll still be focused on the subject when it comes back out from being hidden. AF on is the opposite. Now that's a button that only runs the AF system as you hold the button down. Then that could be your choice. Memory recall is fun. That means when you tap the front lens buttons, and you only have to tap them, you don't have to hold them for this feature, just give the tiniest tap and the lens will instantly motor to exactly the distance you have programmed it to previously. Now to set that memory recall button to a distance, say home plate or your bird feeder, you have to set the switch of course to memory recall, focus on your preferred subject the way you want to focus, however you'd like to focus, you can even focus manually on that distance if you want, say focus for infinity, for astronomical use, astronomers take note, you wouldn't even have to look at anything or even... Take off the lens cap to get your lens focused to infinity using this trick. Now press the memory set button. You'll probably hear a beep. It's stored in memory. Then to recall the distance, just tap the button on the front of the lens again, and boom, you're there. And of course, the last switch, the musical note or no musical note, turns on and off the beeps when you're using that memory recall focus. So that's it. The real question is, is this lens for you? Simple. If you're always banging up on the 200 millimeter setting on your 70 to 200 and you're never really using the shorter end, by all means, this is your lens. You will love it. But you're only going to love it if you don't shoot closer than six feet. If you shoot closer than six feet often or even infrequently, this lens will drive you up the wall. If you just want the long lens and don't need f2.8, then go for the 200 to 500 or the 80 to 400 millimeters. It'll give you longer focal lengths, it'll cost less, and work just great. Honestly, as I said at the beginning, I prefer Canon. In fact, this video is being shot today on my Nikon Z7 with my Canon 100 to 400. L2 lens, and the reason I always have that lens at the front of my bag is because it focuses closer and covers a wider zoom range. It covers 100 to 400 versus only 120 to 300, and I don't need f2.8. But we're all different. The main thing is, if you're out shooting sports, always wish you had more than 200 millimeters. Oftentimes shooting at f2.8 and not shooting close at 2 meters, then by all means, this 120 to 300 millimeter is a gift, a wonderful thing from Nikon for us today. And that's it. Thanks again for watching Ken Rockwell. KenRockwell.com, as brought to you today on KenRockwell.tv.